thank you, uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for for making the time uh, for this meeting. This is um, now our third uh, quarterly uh, Frankfurt uh, branch meeting of the uh, Financial Executives Networking Group. Um, I am uh, Dimi Yar. I've been the co-chair for about half a year now. Um, we lost one uh, co-chair uh, recently, Pierre, uh, but we gained two in exchange, so I'm quite happy. Um, so um, one of the new co-chairs is Armin. He's with us. Um, uh, the other one, uh, Stefan, unfortunately had uh, an emergency to deal with, so I'm sure you will meet him um, next time. Um, so we will, uh, yeah, we'll we'll let Armin uh, introduce himself, and then we will uh, jump into the uh, presentation on pay equity and pay transparency. And um, I hope to keep the actual presentation to somewhere around half an hour, so we have some time to um, um, to uh, discuss any questions afterwards. Um, but I would suggest also in the um, meantime, during the presentation, um, feel free to ask the questions. Um, so I, I expect this is uh, going, this is a topic that will be with us for a while. So uh, Armin. So oh, yes, um, I, I, I'm happy to. So my name is Armin Grunreich, um, and I'm, I'm glad to be here. I have a, a joint the Fang about two months ago. Um, I'm based out of Boston and, and Massachusetts in the United States, uh, but my uh, professional background started in Frankfurt, Germany. And when I started, when I joined the Fang. Somebody approached me and I said, would you be interested in, in um, co-chairing the FANG Frankfurt? And I said, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Um, and in the time of, of Zoom, uh, this is, I think, uh, quite possible. And perhaps uh, if there is a huge number of people that want to be co-chair that are based out of Frankfurt, of course, I'm, I'm also happy to step back. Um, I'm in quantitative finance. So I'm on the investment side, um, asset management. Um, I originally joined Deutsche Bank in the late 90s uh, in Frankfurt in the IT division, uh, was charged with um, managing an uh, innovation team, uh, was initially very big. This was the late 90s. Uh, then it was uh, quite small. Uh, in the mid 2000s, uh, in 2006, in 2006, I transferred to New York uh, into asset management, um, where I worked mostly process uh, engineering uh, and then supported various risk systems uh, and oversaw uh, investments uh, for Deutsche Asset Management. That's why I met Demi. We were colleagues uh, back then at Deutsche Bank or Deutsche Asset Management. Um, and so I'm, I'm, all things come around. So I'm glad to be back uh, and, and do some meaningful work together. I think um, that would be enough uh, to introduce myself, but I think it would be nice, perhaps, Valerie, Mary, if you could just say one sentence uh, or two who you are and um, before we jump into the presentation. So, uh, also. <laughs> um, so I, um... Actually, I'm not a member of FANG, but I'm using my husband's uh, login here, who is a CFO, but I'm a number girl. I'm uh, currently the VP of Human Resources in a company in Virginia. Uh, originally, I'm from Switzerland, started in a bank as well, Credit Suisse, you know the, mm -hmm. <laughs> the story. <laughs> and uh, I'm interested in this subject because we, our company recently merged with a German company. And as head of HR, uh, it is a subject that is very interesting to me. Thank you. Um, my name is Mary and I'm a CFO looking for her next challenge. And I'm interested because I have seen at a number of past positions I've been at, how I was not being paid equitably and not 
necessarily just in terms of males, in terms of other females. So as I'm looking for my next job, I'm thinking about, hey, how do I make sure this time I'm where I should be or how do what, what do I need to know to make me smarter in terms of negotiating? Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, very, very helpful. Thank you, Armin, for uh, asking. Thank you uh, both for providing um, the, uh, the insightful information. So um, then I suggest uh, we jump into the, the topic um, and uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's go through it. So I will share my screen um, and it will be a, you know, a slide deck, not, not very long, but I think uh, quite informative. So let's see. Okay. Um, all right. Are you guys able to see the screen? Yes, I am. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, the broad agenda today, um, equality versus equity. Um, we're going to do a deep dive into the key components of pay equity. We're going to touch upon the new European law on pay transparency, pay equity, and uh, we're going to talk about the um, different potential options um, to approach it. And then we will, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll uh, talk about it. So, uh, so first of all, uh, I would say um, let's look at the social aspect of equality versus equity. And I will use a fairly famous meme for this that you probably have seen. Looks like this. Yeah. So um, three people of different height trying to watch a baseball game. There is a fence in front of them um, without any support. You know, maybe one or two could see the game. The third one definitely would not be able to do it. Um, so if we were to help them, um, the equal treatment would be to give one cube to every one of them. And that would result in two people seeing the game and one person, the short one, not seeing the game. Uh, the equity approach would actually take the same three cubes, the same resources, but allocate them based on the uh, needs or based on the fairness um, that would ensure that we accommodate for the differences, uh, we accommodate for the disadvantages specifically in this case, uh, in a way that allows more people to participate in uh, watching um, the baseball game. So this is the social view of equality versus equity. Um, so social equality focus is on equal treatment. You have one cube each, very equal. Um, with it, we are implying lack of discrimination, lack of favoritism. Uh, we are ignoring individual advantages and disadvantages, and we are ignoring outcomes. Uh, it is easy to implement, ultimately. Yeah, uh, there's no particular um, a problem. I mean, in this case, in, yeah, maybe more complex cases, but equality is not that difficult to implement um, on paper, at least. Equity also tends to be the DI view of equity focus on fair treatment, um, not so much equal. So it's equal plus, if you will. What is fair? Yeah, and that actually um, implies figuring out the disadvantages and trying to uh, uh, you know, compensate for them. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean a quality of outcomes, even though the picture here suggests that I would say it means a broader view of the equality of opportunities. Um, it is in reality difficult to implement, almost impossible. Um, so um, yeah. Whether it is perceived as fair or not in your implementation would depend on how accurate uh, you are in identifying these disadvantages 
and uh, you know whether people agree that this is what needs to be adjusted for and whether you are actually able to adequately um, adjust for them. So this is the social view. Now we're gonna look at the same meme, at the same picture from the perspective of pay equality and pay equity. Yeah, the same exact picture. Now here, let's imagine that the height of the persons represents their role and current compensation, yeah? And keep in mind that when it comes to pay equality, pay equity, we are talking about compensation in a competitive, productive work environment. Yeah, this is no longer sort of the broad socium. Um, this is work where products are produced and services are provided. So back to the picture, let's assume that the tall person is the CEO, highest level of responsibility role and pay already. The middle person is, you know, some kind of a middle manager. And these are your workers, you know, sort of at the at the bottom. Uh, <laughs> sorry for that typo. <laughs> yeah, I don't know <laughs> what happened there. Uh, uh, um, so in any case, um, the height of the person corresponds to their current salary. Let's say salary, um, which you can see on the left. So when it comes to pay equity, I mean, in pay equality, right? Now, obviously there, there is nothing wrong with people in different roles making different amounts of money, yeah? Different complexity, different authority. Uh, this is what we will look at later. These are called the objective factors that differentiate the work and differentiate um, the value of the employees. Uh, so among them, a different pay is okay. Um, now, when you look um, at all the managers or all the CEOs or all the workers, yeah, the question becomes, okay, uh, why are people making different money or should they make different amount of money and how to actually approach this systemically? Let's think about the, 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 the factor of the more money in terms of pay increases. Yeah. So if you were running an organization, um, you know, or you were head of HRs, Valerie's, um, and you were thinking, okay, there is inflation. Yeah, we want to retain people. People are telling us they would like to have more money because the cost of living is going up. So there is an agreement at the company level that there needs to be an increase in compensation. Let's say it's decided that you would increase it by 3% or 5% or whatever it is. Um, and then your choice is, well, how do you actually allocate that pay increase to people? The equal approach would be basically to give everybody or everybody within a certain role um, the same amount of increase. So if you do a 3% increase for everybody, that would be an equal uh, approach to, to compensation. So these are the pay increases here. On the other hand, you could also look at it um, uh, differently. And I'm sort of setting aside the, um, the, the, the approach of, of subjective pay increases where you just kind of give the pool of money to a department head or the manager and tell them, okay, you decide how you want to um, allocate the pay increases to people. Um, because that's neither equal nor equitable. Yeah, this is basically subjective and it's actually quite dangerous, I would say, uh, from a risk perspective, uh, because it, it always has the risk of bias. The equitable approach to pay increases would be to say, okay, is there a way to allocate the same amount of money in a way that actually means something beyond just saying, okay, everybody needs to get more money. And that comes to the, the pay factors or the value factors. And this is where, for example, in, in, in my example, you could decide that you might want to allocate that money based on the lengths of service. Yeah, I know this is a tricky concept in performance mentality, um, uh, even though it has been uh, indicated and proven many times that uh, there is value to uh, uh, to tenure. Um, so let's just say here you uh, 
pick that as your allocation basis. So what will happen now in this case, you are not actually adjusting for disadvantages. Yeah, you're not necessarily giving the worker more money uh, than the manager or the CEO because they have a lower level role. You've actually identified um, a, a, a factor or a driver that you decided to reward instead of just rewarding everybody the same. In this example, it's uh, years of service. So let's just assume that the CEO in this picture just joined. Yeah, so he has zero years with this company. Manager was here for one year. The worker was here for two years. So if you assign a value to each year of service, you could actually allocate the same amount of money in a way that actually means something. Yeah. So to me, this is a way to think about pay equity. And the important thing here compared to the social equity is that to me, it's, it's a slippery slope to go into the trying to find the disadvantages and trying to reward them using essentially shareholders' money. Your best bet is actually to find the, the value factors, the, the value drivers that are meaningful, that are actually contributing to the performance of the organization and actually make a point of rewarding those. Um, and this is again where it would be different from the uh, pay for performance because performance tends to still be subjective. Uh, it depends on how you evaluate people, what metrics you use. Um, but here, the point is that a lot of these drivers could actually be objective. And I will give you a few examples. So, um, yeah. Uh, before we got, jump to the examples, so pay equality, um, equal pay for equal work. Yeah, this is what we were talking about in general. This is the slogan. This is the idea. Also, it's the idea behind the current pay transparency um, and pay equity um, regulations, uh, which, of course, I think we all agree that, um, you know, when everything else is equal, people should be paid equally for what they do. Uh, now pay equality has some limitations in terms of what I just uh, uh, described, uh, in terms of approaching, how do you approach pay increases? How do you approach pay progression in general? Um, so I want to introduce the other view for the pay equity or other way to think about it. And to me, this is thinking beyond equal pay for equal work. And I formulate it as equal pay for equal value. And I mentioned some of the value drivers and the focus. So to me, pay equity will work if we actually focus on the value drivers and try to structure our compensation system in a way that rewards the employee value, which actually extends beyond the, you know, the specific contribution they make in a specific role. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah. In this way, if you identify the pay drivers and you assign values to them, and then you collect that information and you basically apply it to all your employees, uh, it will work in a way that is equal for each driver, uh, for each person, but in um, you know combination, everybody will have certain um, additional compensation um, uh, given to them based on the value factors that are specific to them. And a lot of these value factors could accumulate uh, over time. So, in this sense, if you're focusing on specific value drivers, the the pay, uh, uh, you know, these drivers can be transparent, which is one of the requirements of the uh, EU uh, law, and they can actually be easy to implement. Um, so it's more drivers, so it's a bit more complex than just paying everybody the same. But I think a lot of people would say that if you find the right uh, value drivers, the end result will be more fair and it will be perceived as more fair by the employees, which is actually the key to the retention and the engagement 
of the people. They have to perceive that the compensation system is fair. Um, so, yeah, so just to mention, this is my uh, my my view. Um, okay, what is pay equity? Um, I believe it is equitable uh, or pay a pay reflecting the full value of each individual's contribution to the enterprise value. And I look at it as a pyramid. Uh, at the bottom is basically what we are used to focusing on, the role and job specific value. Yeah, for hundreds of years, our system has been designed around jobs and we put value on those jobs uh, and it could be market value from benchmarking, from just advertising a job. And then, you know, if nobody applies, raising the rate and so forth. Uh, and this is basically, you know, we haven't even gotten to figuring that out uh, in terms of the full equality um, of, of all people in all jobs. Yeah. But what I am suggesting that that by itself is not enough. What I'm suggesting is that there are two more components to the individual value, to the employee value in each organization. So the middle part of the pyramid is the human specific value. Um, and this is broadly the value of knowledge, the value of experience, the value of proven character that each employee brings, yeah, to different extents, um, uh, where the people are different. Um, Ultimately, on the top, this is the company-specific value. This, what I, what I would suggest is that, for example, you know, take me, yeah, and I have a finance background. So with my skills, I can go work for a large company, successful one, and I will get some kind of a compensation package that will be probably larger than that at a small company. Or if it's a startup, I may not get a cash bonus. I may get stock options that may never materialize. I am saying that part of the compensation has to actually link to the actual company you're working for. And um, you know that is part of the participation. Because in the end, if you think about the, 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 the profitability of an enterprise, the, uh, the profit is the value that's being created by everybody in that uh, company. So to the extent that we are not sharing that value that's being created with the employees uh, fairly or at all, you could say that we are underappreciating or undervaluing their contribution. Because in the end, if you take all the employees out, there will be no profit. <laughs> so there has to be some part of the profit after our current compensation expenses um, or other value, yeah, if you're looking at KPIs or some other ways to measure whether your organization is successful, there has to be a combined contribution of the individuals you have on payroll to that result, whether or not you can break it down specifically to their roles and, uh, and responsibilities. So this is... Um, um, you know, I try to put it into sort of um, uh, these definitions um, where I would say that at the lower level, the job role level, you're paying for the skills, you're paying for the performance. This is what we're used to. Skills are usually defined by the salary performance, usually defined by the performance bonus. Maybe promotions are there. Um, so I consider sort of paying the, you know, equally for the for the equal skills is equalization. This is sort of your equality. This could be equity, if you like. Paying for performance is supposed to be about meritocracy. Yeah, so this is supposed to be about actually recognizing the contributions above and beyond the, the sort of the, the skills that are necessary to do the job. It's rarely happens that way. Usually we have target bonuses, you know, that just vary with, you know, how well the company is doing or with the subjective opinions uh, of the managers or the way that your evaluation, uh, performance evaluation is structured. There could be formulaic bonuses, you know, or purely discretionary bonuses. So what I'm suggesting is that a good pay for performance system should actually reward 
and promote meritocracy and not just kind of give a bigger bonus to somebody with a bigger role and, and be done with it. Human specific value, to me, this is your recognition. If you are not paying for things that have to do with individuals' experience, education, character, feet, knowledge, then basically you're not fully recognizing them. You're just recognizing them to the extent that they perform a particular role. But as you know, you know, you could have one person who just started in the role and you could have somebody with 10 years of experience who actually knows five other roles as well and could actually move around and do those five other roles when necessary. And they could mentor the person who just started in this role. Yeah. But if you're just paying for the job and you say, well, the both of them are doing the same job, then you would basically be forced to pay them equally. And then it would be perceived as unfair to the person who has a lot more um, knowledge and experience and value, even though it's not the value that sort of shows up every minute of the day in that job. It is a general value for the organization, and you do want to have those people. Yeah, if you didn't want to have them, you would fire everybody every year and just hire college graduates uh, on January one, and then you would have no business, you would have no enterprise. Yeah, we just are failing to recognize this value, or we're failing to systemically recognize it. Uh, we're sort of pushing it into the performance evaluation, where you kind of judge sort of how people are, are working and, you know, their behavior and, and character traits, but it doesn't really have any systemic, um, um, you know, I would say approach to that. Um, and that is uh, a problem. And that is actually, I'm suggesting that this is the biggest problem that we have today. And it's, it's what is ultimately behind a lot of our attrition, a lot of our disengagement, and a lot of our bad managers. Um, that we have in place. So the top one is sharing in the success of the company. I call that participation. If you are not sharing um, the company's success with employees, then you are not allowing them to participate in it. You, you, you know, and um, there is value in that to the obviously to the employees and to the company. And if it doesn't, if it's not there people would feel unfair. So for example, if you're working for your company in the same job, whatever, the company has the same number of people today as they did, you know, 10 years ago, but the profit of the company went, you know, from, I don't know, 1 million to 100 million. So it grew by 100 times, but your compensation and everybody else, aside maybe from the most senior leaders uh, of the company has grown by 5%, you would probably feel that there is a disconnect. <laughs> Something is off because, you know, you're working, you're contributing. Clearly, your work, you know, somehow is part of that profit growth. But if it doesn't come back to you, it feels unfair. So I am saying that this is the true definition of pay equity. You have to have all three components. If you're only fo focusing on the role and that a lot of companies are doing just with the, you know, continuous compensation benchmarking that they just keep, you know, marking people to market. I'm saying you're actually missing the biggest piece of, of recognition and, and participation, um, which is why, you know, uh, you're failing to achieve the, the level of, of well-being and, uh, uh, you know, satisfaction and engagement in the work um even if you don't lose people i mean you could be paying a lot of money so people have nowhere to go but they will not be as as productive as they could be um so this pyramid is key okay um let me spend uh, one minute on the uh, role of the employee uh, tenure in pay equity um so I recommend that you Google and read a short article that was published a few months ago in Harvard Business Review. Don't underestimate the value of employee tenure. So uh, it's, it's, it's a very short article, but it's very profound. 
I actually can't believe how profound it is. Um, so it's it's a good read. But basically, um, these guys from Mercer, you know, which is a major compensation consulting firm, um, the, the, you know, they conducted an, you know a, a meta analysis of of different studies, and they were actually able to determine that there is in fact a significant positive um, correlation between the um, uh, you know uh, between the tenure and the uh, financial performance and operational excellence. And they attributed it to two major factors. One they called general human capital, which they said, yeah, this is kind of your knowledge, your degrees, your experience doing specific jobs. Um, this is transferable. Yeah, this is what they say. You can buy it in the market. You can basically get somebody from the general human capital, which we also call institutional knowledge. You can get that. The other one, the second type, and I highlighted it here, is the firm-specific human capital. And they're saying it consists of knowledge, social networks, mastery, know-how generated through the experience of working in that one organization. And with the customer supplies, you know, you just know how things are done. You know the cloud clients and, and uh, um, uh, the processes, the protocols, uh, initiatives, programs, people you know, not, not least, this has value. And actually it is not transferable, yeah? When you leave your company and you go to another company, when you start in the new company, they will basically tell you, you know what? Forget everything you learned at that other company, we do things differently. So unless you're a strategic hire, when they are actually hiring you for the specific knowledge that you developed at that company because they want to copy it, but most of our hiring, most of our um, sort of movement of the workforce is what we call replacement hiring. And what I'm suggesting is that not just the companies and the employees lose a great deal of knowledge because it becomes irrelevant. It becomes not useful in the new uh, company, um, but also our society as a whole is losing that knowledge. Yeah, this is something that people spend time building and it just evaporates. And this is one of the reasons why we are not as productive, as innovative, as good as we could be. So very profound article, highly recommended. This is a visual visualization of what you just said. Uh, you know, looking at the uh, lengths of experience, uh, the tenure, general, you know, obviously generalized. So when you start your job, wherever you go, that you have a value gap actually where there's a lot you don't know. You're gonna uh, bump your head against the wall a few times, uh, you know, but over the period of time, I don't know, six months, one year, two, three, depends. You will basically get up to the point of where you are, you basically know everything. You are very efficient. You know where to go. You're doing things the right way. And this is sort of where you equalize with the value that you're being paid. What happens after that is that your value keeps increasing. This is not, you know, because our jobs are not um, defined. Yeah, they, they constantly evolve. Things evolve. Systems evolve. They need people who can learn new things in their existing job. So to the extent that you are picking up these experiences and, and uh um, developing with it, your value to the employer is growing. It will continue to grow. Your market value is also growing, but not as much. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, Adam Grant, um, quite famous, he called the difference between the pay of the long-term employees and their market value, loyalty tax. What I'm suggesting is that that's not all of it. That, that's just a small part to the market value. There's a much bigger piece that market is missing because it's irrelevant to the market. And that is your uh, firm specific capital, the second type um, that is valuable to the firm that you're working for. And I call it loyalty premium um, uh, in, in, in my startup. Okay. Let me pause here maybe briefly um, to see if there are any questions because then we're gonna jump into a few slides and. I will talk a bit about the European law on pay transparency and equity, and you will see how it resonates 
with the things that I just uh, described. I have a few friends um, that have been at the same company for, I don't know, 15, 20, 25 years. And I keep saying to them, do you know if you're at the market rate of what you should be? But I like your analysis here because there is a ton of loyalty premium knowledge that they both have for having been there forever in my right. mind. Um, and they don't think they're being paid market, but then this premium should be added on. So how do you evaluate you know, you, you can easily look to see, okay, everybody in this role, this is the average market rate, whatever. But then the premium, in my mind, understand what you say, should be on top of that. So how do you go about thinking through, is your premium 10% over the market, 20% over the market, 50%? How do you reason through that? Yeah. Well, that's actually, that goes to the core of, of um, the, the, the uh, you know, what sort of um, created my startup. So this is what we, we are offering actually to, to companies, but we are doing it in a very simple way. Um, so we actually ignore the market. Yeah, Market is completely irrelevant to us. Um, I mean, it's okay to do compensation benchmarking occasionally, um, but you, know, um, you hire people to come work for you on a particular contract. Yeah, So that is fair to them because they joined. Over the years, what I'm suggesting is that you should have a performance component. Yeah, you do the best you can because if you don't reward performance, then that will feel unfair. But just rewarding performance, just having a performance program will not result in incredibly better performance, especially not in sustainable one. And it tends to have counter sort of uh, intuitive or counterproductive tendencies when people will try to sort of game the system and get their bonus and they might cut some corners. So performance compensation is a bit tricky. What we are suggesting with the loyalty premium is that basically you should use your performance evaluations to actually decide whether the person is competent and, and good enough in terms of their character, in terms of their approach to their job, to their customers, to the company you know, um, whether they're good enough. So this is sort of binary. Um, and if they're good enough, then you keep them, yeah? And if you, you keep them, then you should reward them. And we are suggesting that the easiest uh, way to reward them is actually to use the lengths of service and do it as a, a equal reward for everybody in monetary terms. So not like a 2% increase for everybody, but you figure out what the meaningful amount should be, let's say $1,000, and you do that. And basically, you know, if you, uh, you know, but what I'm suggesting is that with that, you know, you should not drag people along who are toxic or incompetent or unproductive. You should be firing them. Yeah, so this doesn't create the environment where, you know, we reward mediocrity. The opposite. What it does is it actually tells the employees, hey, we see you, we appreciate you, we value you, we value things that you bring to this company, what you've learned about us, how you've learned to work with our systems and with our people, we value that. And, you know, in the end, once you do that, as long as it's not subjective, yeah, then it will have value to the employees. So it doesn't matter whether it comes out to 500 or 1,000 or 2,000 or whatever, what is important is that you acknowledge that piece of value that people bring. And specifically, you should acknowledge the value of the uh, long-term service. Now, there's common uh, you know, argument that people who have been in the same role for a long time, you know, that they're somehow disgruntled, they're uh, you know, objecting to change, they're somehow not easy. What I am suggesting is that we have, if, if so, we have made it that way because we have been ignoring their value <laughs> and they haven't been able to put a finger on what that value is. Yeah, and I'm basically doing that for them. And I'm saying that once you acknowledge that value, uh, the people will reciprocate. They will, and unless they're completely, you know, gutted by years of neglect, they will actually step up 
and it has happened. There are industry cases um, um, like uh, with Peter Stavros, for example, from KKR, where he's using a similar approach and he's seeing ridiculous increase in long-term employee engagement and quality and performance when he is giving them uh, part of the ownership that is actually structured to reward their lengths of service. In part, he does other things. Um, but this is where I'm suggesting that you don't want to overcomplicate things. If you do like a build a model with a hundred points, you know, and then you say, well, you know, you measure 72% on the integrity scale and this person is 86%, that will kill the whole thing. <laughs> I am saying you only need two criteria. You haven't fired them and they haven't left. And if that happens, they should be included in this pool of loyalty premium, yeah? But if they don't perform, you fire them for other reasons. I'm saying this is not something that companies should be playing with because this is kind of, part of the problem has been the subjectivity. So I'm suggesting that just being objective and transparent and consistent, um, you know, is enough to make a difference when you approach loyalty premium, what I call the human factor, yeah, rewarding people for the human factor. Um, hopefully that somehow answers the question. Yeah, no, let no. me jump. Uh, we, we're gonna have a, 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 a stop in, uh, a hard stop in, in 10 minutes or so. So let me let me jump through the, the rest of the slides and uh, then we, we come back a little bit uh, uh, to, to any other remaining questions. And obviously I'm always open to, you know, continue the conversation. This, this conversation will be with us for a long time. And uh, the view that I'm showing you is not a standard view. I don't even think anybody is offering this view, but I truly believe that this is um, key to doing it right. Um, pay transparency, pay equity. It's a new law 23, it starts implementing 24. Uh, it applies to employers with 100 or more employees. It focuses on salaries. That's important to keep in mind. And it focuses just on gender equality and equity. Yeah, not racial, not any other factors. They are basically just comparing men and women um, and, uh, and their salaries. So they kind of, I, I would say this is the first step. Yeah, that's how I look at it. But, you know, they are saying that you have to disclose your pay or the pay range. You cannot ask candidates about their pay history. Um, employees are given the uh, right to request information about pay ranges and average pay for categories doing the same work or work of equal value, which is an interesting terminology, um, but it generally relates to the, the work families as people in HR know it. Um, Criteria. So this is where criteria. So what 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 they are saying is that if you are going to actually differentiate pay over time or have some kind of a progression scale where people in the same general role would be um, uh, you know paid more or if they move um, you know uh, career wise you have to use gender neutral criteria. Basically what they're saying, the criteria cannot be subjective. You have to use objective criteria and you should use them con con um, uh, you know, consistently uh, when it comes to building your pay structure or progression. Yeah? Information on what criteria are used to determine the pay levels and pay progression needs to be made available to workers and may require their approval. In Europe, usually through the Workers' Council, yeah, but you can't just, you know, pull uh, these criteria from the air. You have to defend them as an employer. So, um, you know, again, um, focus on criteria. In terms of the equity itself, basically, it's again, it's gender equity. Um, what we are suggesting is that you don't focus just on gender. You focus on on um, all the outliers. You Ideally, you want to basically make sure you have no, um, you know, bias in the system. This is the spirit of the law, and I'm sure they will keep building on it. Um, yeah. 
you can account for objective gender neutral factors. Um, so this is basically where the law actually allows and encourages to actually uh, come up with these factors that would be used to differentiate um, um, you know, in, in pay, which would not violate the law. It's only uh, when you have accounted for the objective fact factors. And if you're still coming up to a gap between all the women in that role and all the men in that role that is more than 5%, then you have to fix that gap. Um, yeah, so this is the gist of the, um, of the European law on pay transparency, pay equity. As I said, now I think you can see how it relates to what um, we discussed. And I believe it will continue to build on that, but it's moving in the right direction and there is a way to comply with it. So um, I'm going to highlight two traps. Yeah, so I, I, there are two options that I do not recommend companies following because I don't think they will uh, get you to, to the result you want. So compliance for the sake of compliance. Yeah, so this is basically where you take the law literally you run the numbers as the law says they need to be reported. And then you basically try and probably manipulate them somehow or just make the adjustments to get them under 5%. Um, you know, this will not last. Yeah, this is not gonna last and it will not, uh, it may not even work. It may not be even acceptable to the employees um, because, uh, or the employee working councils, um, um, you know, there could be pushback. Uh, compliance to compensation benchmarking. Also, you know, if you basically go the simple route and say, you know what, we're going to pay everybody in the same role the same, regardless of everything. So you just do a market, you know, compensation benchmark and say, okay, this role is going to pay 50,000. That's it. Yeah. I mean, it will comply with the law but it will not be considered fair because you are ignoring things like the lengths of service, uh, you know, or, or uh, you know, educational background or even particular skills or certifications that people bring. Um, so I think it's gonna be costly and, and uh, difficult to maintain. It will ensure equality, but not equity. So um, I, I imagine it will be challenged sooner or later for a meeting the critical pay um, uh, value factors. So yeah, and employees will probably not be particularly thrilled uh, with it. So the recommended approach, now there's a bit of a small text here, but the point is that basically I recommend that you take this opportunity to actually revisit your pay philosophy and you actually decide what it is that is of value in your employees. And there could be general things like uh, education, for example. You know, you could say, you know what, people with uh, advanced degrees, yeah, you know, they might bring extra value. Yeah, they learned something that others maybe have not learned. Uh, people with years of experience, when you hire somebody with 10 years of experience versus two years, you might say, you know what, those extra eight years, they're worth something. Yeah, it, it, it is not necessary. I mean, it, both would be okay yeah, if your minimum requirement is two years, work, both would meet the requirement for that role. But this is where you're actually eliminating the concept of being overqualified because you're actually rewarding for it. So nobody's overqualified and you have a mechanism to take those people on board, take the best people you can find, you know, pay them fairly. Um, uh, and this is basically about thinking about what that would entail you know, collecting that information, modeling it, running it through the system, comparing it to the current pay, and then figuring out what you would actually do uh, in terms of implementing it. What I'm suggesting, if you do it this way, if you do it right, and you have five, 10 pay equity factors, you can have different ones for specific roles as well, not just sort of universal for the company. Uh, what I suggest that this is what will actually give you an advantage. Yeah, it would not just comply with the laws, it will actually set you apart and it will set you on a sort of on a cruising speed uh, on the highway of, of uh, progress. 
because this is the right way to do it. Um, and this is where, again, um, yeah. Um, yeah, what I'm suggesting, if you do it that way, this will enhance your culture and your productivity and well-being and do a lot of things that you may not even realize that uh, what it is that being paid fairly uh, or perception of being paid fairly, what it does to people. And from behavioral psychology, it, it does a lot. It means a lot. Um, so, yeah, I mean, my company specifically provides a specific plan to, ta to tackle the tenure, the length of service. And we are suggesting that our design, which is also transparent, consistent, objective, fair and meaningful, that it will by itself push you close to a uh, hundred percent retention engagement and, and have actually a return on, on this investment. Um, uh, we offer actually three certifications here. One is this plan. If you implement it to our guidelines, you can get the stamp. We actually offer pace transparency solutions. So what I described in terms of approaching the entire compensation um, uh, you know, uh, system with the salaries, performance bonuses, and other awards. If we help it design and it uh, provides the the uh, you know the the skills recognition, the meritocracy in performance, mm -hmm. and the recognition of the human factor and the participation in the business success, uh, we can certify that um, uh, result. And we also have uh, this quirky thing you know, lay of alternatives pledge, uh, which we suggest that companies, you know, doing knee jerk layoffs are creating, they're breaking the trust with the employees. And we're suggesting that they can be a lot more thoughtful and transparent about how they would approach situations that uh, might require layoffs or they require cost reduction. And actually they could choose alternative to those like, you know, cutting the, the pay and the hours uh, and making it uh, equitable, you know, temporarily. Okay, key messages. So what I'm saying is that this particular, the pay equity pay transparency is an opportunity to actually flip your compensation from being an operating expense to being a capital expense, being an investment, being a driver for staff retention and for your profit growth. Um, I say, don't stress about it. I mean, I saw, um, uh, you know, posts that it will require AI and big consulting firms to figure this out. No, I just explained to you, you can do it. I'm sure you will get into compliance with um, proper drivers and then you fix it a little bit. Um, and I do hope that you will take the third option, the proper pay equity design, not just sort of check the box compliance. 